So good morning, everyone. I'm glad you're here at Paula's Picks. And as always, we have some interesting people for you to listen to and perhaps utilize in your lives or in the lives of other people that you know. So they are from the Center on Grieving Children, but they also work with um, different kinds of grief, whether it be children or adults, um, depending on what it is. And you'll hear where they are located in case you wanted to get in touch with them. And they're going to talk to you about their volunteer program especially, um, which they really need to make this program continue. So um, the uh, program director is over here, and her name is Susan Giambalvo. And then there is, um, what is your title? York County Coordinator. York County Coordinator for um, the Grieving Center for Children. Um, and it is um, Janice Zerlo. I had to remember these are tricky <laughs> names. So I introduce you to them. I hope that you get a lot of information, and I hope that some of you consider volunteering. So, ladies, Thank what you. can we, who would like to start? I'll let Susan start. Oh, okay. Well, thank you very much, Paula, for having us join you this morning. It's great to be here and to have a chance to tell everybody a little bit more about the Center for Grieving Children and what we offer and how they might get involved. Um, the Center for Grieving Children is in its 27th year this year oh of providing that. grief support services to children mm -hmm. and families. And we have always had our program has been located in Portland, but three years ago now, we started a program site in Sanford. So we're very excited to have the opportunity to bring our programming to more people in right. York County and really make it easier for people to access services mm -hmm. if they need them. Uh, mainly what we provide are peer support groups for children ages 3 to 18 and their parents and caregivers uh, for children who've experienced the death of someone close to them. So it's really an opportunity for the whole family or any family members who want to, to come and be able to be with others who've also experienced a loss. Uh, families tell us that it really helps them feel less alone in what they're going through, that it's really helpful mm -hmm. to hear from other people who are, how are they getting through it? What, what right. is helpful to them? And learn from each other. And just to be in that safe, accepting environment where mm -hmm. it's okay to talk about your loss and it's okay to talk about the person who died. Yeah, I spoke a little earlier to you about my um, son-in-law who died uh, just about three years ago. And my his daughter, who's now 11, she had the most difficult time with the whole process. And people don't really understand, even people in the school system, her teacher that year, she would put her head down and she would sob and she couldn't do her work and her mother would have to go pick her up. And her teacher said, don't you think that a year is enough time well, and society as a whole doesn't give us a whole lot of permission, you know, exactly. and they don't realize that grief is a lifelong experience right. and everyone does it in their own time, in their own way, and that it's really, you know, you're never the same after someone dies, especially a, a parent, but you learn to live in a different way. You learn to live with that grief and hopefully become stronger through the tears and through that grieving process. Yeah, um, and I could don't. even see changes in her, like with her hygiene, she didn't want to mm -hmm. fix her hair or be dressed up like the other kids for school. She, did, she, she didn't want to do anything. And um, so that would have been a good program for her because we did look for it, but there wasn't in Springfield mm -hmm. that we could find. Um, so, so she went to counseling and she got her a good counselor and, and that worked pretty well, but she's still grieving. So, you know, it's going to take some time. It does take time and we really want 
everybody to know that. Um, and the so the center services are available to anybody at any point. Mm -hmm. We have families that may come to us very soon after the death has taken place, oh, yeah. within you know a few weeks or a, a month or two, looking for services and support. But sometimes it might be years later right. that somebody said, you know what, I I'm still struggling with this. I could really use some support, or maybe now I'm finally ready to even work through my mm -hmm. grief and I could use some support. And um, that's not, we have groups for adults as well. We have a young adult group, 19 to 30, for 19 and to 30 And that is year great old. to hear. And we have a bereaved parents group. And we also have young widow and widowers groups. We have two of those actually. One Which, meets in Portland oh, as and we one talk, meets that's in a great in program to So have. we see, especially yeah. I find with those, with the adult groups that people may come, Many years, many years following yeah. the death and but sometimes with kids too they may come for a little while mm -hmm. they've gotten what they need and off they go and then two or three years down the road they feel they could use some more support again mm -hmm. and may come back so we really try to make it flexible and as open as possible for families to join at any point and to stay as long as the service is That's helpful really to them. Good. Yeah. And the process is really a deliberately slow process for families. Mm -hmm. You know, when they call and we send out information about the groups, because a lot of time they're looking for grief counseling or grief therapy, and we tell them that that's not what we do, mm -hmm. but we do offer referrals if they're looking for individual counselors. Um, but we really, it's peer support, so it's, um, Trained facilitators facilitate the groups. There would be two or three in a group. And then we, the, the peers, the kids that are in the group or the adults that are in the group really are supporting each other right. by talking about their, 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 their feelings and their stories and saying what's going on for them. And it's really amazing because kids and adults, families come in at different points in their grief journey. So you might get a family brand new mm -hmm. that um, had a loss just six months ago. And so they sit down and they hear another adult or another child talk about how they're doing and it's been a year for them or it's been two years and they can see maybe some light at the end of the tunnel right, exactly. that it's not always going to be this heavy it's not going to always be this sad all the time right. it may be like that around the holidays this around is a, an a anniversary time. Do you see an influx right. of people coming in during the holidays a lot of calls yeah a lot of calls around this time of year um, and I think that it's really important for people to have that hope, but they're really getting it from each other. Right. So the, the, it's not, you know, it's not us, you know, it's really a sense of community that the groups become, um, kids become friends where they would never have had a friendship, but because of that, that commonality of having a parent die or having a grandparent die, it's a horrible thing, but it really does bring people together. It does. Yeah. And like no other, because even family members can't fully, if they haven't been through it, can't fully help another family member out. And, you know, they don't get sick of hearing them talk no, about it, but, but it, it just, you know, the person who's grieving feels like, well, gosh, you know, they look at me like, Are you, you're not over this yet. You're not dating somebody new yet. You're not, you know, you're not moving on yet. Why are you still so sad? Well, it's, you know, because nobody wants to be with someone all the time when they're yeah. sad, but that's what the center it does. It doesn't just that's go away do. instantly. Yeah, yeah, we allow that. Do you um, notice any kind of relationships that the children or other adults build with the volunteers? Yeah, I think there's definitely a trust. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. we've had an influx of, um, of volunteers just recently who started off with our program three years ago and have kind of moved out of the adult support group on our normal Wednesday evenings, uh -huh. and they've actually moved to facilitate the Young Widow Widowers groups on Fridays. 
And so that was a big, I, I was really apprehensive that that was going to be a big loss for our groups. But with the way that we do it is we really transition them and the, the people in the groups come to accept them. And it's really not about the facilitators so much as right. it is about the the way that that we're taught to facilitate mm -hmm. because if everyone there that's facilitating a group is doing it with the same model that we train people in and that we work with people about you know you don't sit there and fix things you don't right. judge right. you don't you know you don't offer solutions right. you reflect you might say wow that sounds really hard you know what you're going through does anybody else have similar feelings mm -hmm. so it's really a reflective feeling you're really it's we call we call our volunteers hearts with ears because that's really nice what idea. it's all about yeah, great so that's, that's the best way name. to kind of explain it but you know our volunteers are amazing people and, and tell we, us tell us a little bit about where they come from uh, your volunteers what they come uh, from all, all over, over the place <laughs> <laughs> which is great it's a wonderful mix of people and probably yeah. Well, I, maybe I'm biased, but the most wonderful <laughs> group of people that you could hope to meet. They're just so generous with their, with their time and attention. So we have some volunteers who might be college students. Uh -huh. um, we have volunteers who are retired folks. We, and, and, then, and everything in between, everyone in between. We, people might be teachers or have experience working with kids. They might be professional counselors or um, some mental health professional in their day job, uh -huh. but they could just as easily be construction worker or a lawyer or barber a barber yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah um, I mean, we have it's really all of yeah it's a very diverse and you mentioned about a corporation you get some volunteers through corporations yes yeah, so there's many different ways for people to volunteer with the center we've been talking a lot about the groups and all the groups are facilitated by trained volunteers as Janice explained mm -hmm. so that's really our, one of our largest commitments that a volunteer might make uh, we have groups come in from businesses to help us do service projects um, for example down in Sanford we've had done stuff through the United Way of York oh, County yeah. and in Portland as well through the United Way uh, legacy group has come and done a big service project yeah. for us mm -hmm. um, we have some volunteers from IDEX today or tomorrow who are coming wow. <laughs> to do a project for us. So it could be a one-day thing. We need volunteers to help us in the office, right. answering phones and doing mailings and things like you that. Didn't think about that, but that's true. We yeah, have volunteers who our whole board is made up of volunteers. volunteers. We have lots of committees that do our fundraising events and really help to make sure that the center has the, the financial stability right. that we need because all of our services are provided free of charge to families. So you need that yeah. influx of so, monetary. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So volunteers play a large part in that as well, supporting fundraising. I think for the what center is it, 150 over 150 volunteers in one week support yes. our groups oh yeah. so yeah so that's a, when you think about that that's a, lot, a lot of, of people. people you know there's we have a small staff in portland and you know we we just we really rely on them a lot and it's an well did i thing. notice on one of um on a line i was looking at the things did you have some kind of a uh, program in the summer where, for fundraising, where there were balloons and and uh, the children were there? I I can't remember if it, maybe it was the Barbara Bush Center, but it was a program. They had a big fair. No, that wasn't. That us. wasn't. No. It must have been the Barbara Bush Center. Yeah, we um, are we're on we're on Facebook and Twitter. Our website um, is really. 
um, fantastically updated with articles and and lots of different lots of ways um, to get support just through our website but um, we take phone calls nine to five during the day from schools and family members and you know clergy um, hospitals that are looking for support or looking for information of how to support people mm -hmm. so our groups are just uh, they're big but they're a small part of what the center does as a whole actually and um, you know we have a couple of other programs the TLC program which is a tender that? living care program and it's for families um, ages 3 to 18 and their their adult or gui um, guardian caregiver um, and those are also for uh, kids with their family members and it's for if someone has a serious illness in their family. Mm -hmm. So the person with the serious illness can come and be in, a, in their own group, the caregiver, and then the children. Oh. The same as yeah. our bereavement groups, they split up into age-appropriate gr age groups. Uh -huh. And they can support each other, peer support, again, facilitated by volunteers, and really just get the support that they need for the changes that they go through the, the worries that they might have about their parent going in the hospital or, you know, not, not feeling well and all that that, all that that impacts a family. It's, it's huge. Right. So. It has to be used. Huge. Yeah. Um, I can remember being, uh, I'm also a chaplain and, um, I went to Brigham and Women's as part of my training. Um, and they called me up to the NICU, and there was a family. They were Puerto Rican. They were kind of hard to understand, but they had, the baby was dying. And um, it was uh, quite old, maybe nine months. And they had it all dressed. They wanted me to baptize it, so I, I did, you know. And, of course, having been ca Catholic at the time, and uh, most Puerto Ricans... Or Hispanics are are Catholic, a lot of them are, and uh, so they had her dressed in her outfit, and um, the nurse kept coming in and taking her vitals and everything, and, um, but they didn't really want to hold her. They were really frightened, and so we went into another room, and I carried the baby in, and um, it, it was a really sad thing because that passed the baby from one to the other. They got calmer and the nurse was talking to them and I was talking to them and then uh, the nurse gave her to me and she died in my arms. And it was really, really sad because the parents just didn't believe it. Even after all the time that she spent in the NICU, they, did, they weren't accepting it. And they rolled this big um, thing in and it, they laid the baby on it, and they had a camera, and they took pictures of the baby. Um, maybe they felt that would help them. I don't know. But um, I had a really hard time. And, I mean, I never had anybody die in my arms, especially a baby. And I had no, there was no help for me there. I mean, we talked a little about it in our group as we yeah. met. But not enough. Right. I spent a lot of years just thinking about that. You know. they, we um, we we do in our our groups. We t we hear a lot of s very sad stories, and that's one thing at the center that we. Um, we do really well for each other is that we do a lot of self care. So for our volunteers, beginning of the night. Um, there we have a group and then the families come and we do the activities with the with the families and then at the end of the night we have the vo the volunteers again have a post group so that anything that they were triggered by that happened in the in the night on the night um, that they can leave that that there in the group and it's it's very um, it's it keeps our volunteers 
I think, able to continue because right. if you get burnt out from that, that's right. We call it vicarious trauma and um, or it, compassion or compa fatigue. Compassion fatigue is another very common thing to to call it. But um, you know, it's it's burnout, which it whatever burnout. way you want to look at it, it's burnout, and it's really you know, if you don't take care of yourself and you don't you don't express how you feel then you get really weighed down by it and it's really it's you hard talked about activities like meaning working with groups um, on their issues right or their problems yeah we do a lot of we have uh, a lot of activities um, that help the kids get to know each other help the kids be able to talk about their loss and and what that was and what it's like you know things um, we play a game of Jenga which is oh, the stacking yes, the blocks and that. the kids will write their own questions on it like what was your what was your loved one's favorite um, ice cream uh -huh. you know and, and it's really to get the kids talking and to get them to know each other and it not being a really it's not all sad and tears right. it's a lot of fun and laughter and kids actually say I don't think I laughed before I came here because they felt guilty about right. laughing. They felt like, wow, I'm supposed to be sad all the time. And then they come and, and they learn to laugh again and it's okay, you know? They don't feel like, oh, my mom is gonna be thinking that I'm not missing my, my dad right. or my dad's gonna be thinking I don't miss my mom or right. you know, my parents will think that I don't miss my brother if I'm laughing. But those are real things and kids need to, need to be able to express all of those feelings. Of course they do. And do you incorporate artwork in that? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So there must be a lot of really positive things that come out of that. We really d try to give the, ch the children, especially the adults too, multiple avenues for expression because especially for the younger children, they don't have the words to right. express everything that's going on for them. Mm -hmm. And that cognitively, their brains haven't de developed enough yet even maybe to understand all of the permanency ar around death and um, what, it, you know, what it really means. So we use a lot of artwork, we use games, we'll use puppet theaters. Oh, that must be we play, dress up. play, dress yeah. up, all kinds of different things just to create that space where children can themselves. express themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And we also use a lot of movement as well, both yeah. uh, locations. Well, we ha one ro have rooms where um, people can get their emotions out physically. Mm -hmm. So if they need to go in, if they have big energy and right. they need some space to wave their arms and scream <laughs> or hit something, or they need a space that can be quiet um, and and actually very low level of stimulation, they can create that in these rooms. Um, so kids have options and everything at the center is very much choice. <laughs> um, people always have the option to participate, they have the option to share, but they have the option to pass. Uh, we really want people to feel like they're, you know, they're in control of what they, what they need to do and they know what best Mm -hmm. what that is for them. You have, um, you mentioned you have teens too in there and and children and I wondered if th there were any of those who say their father or their mother died and um, they didn't want to have any connection with their with the father or the mother who was alive because of it. It was almost a blame issue and um, I just wondered if you s would see that in, in their groups as they were talking or, I, you know, I've seen it just on TV where they've shown um, sections of kids who don't want to even be by their parent who is alive. You know, they feel guilty, they, they're angry, and they, they don't see them as people who would be helpful to them in their grieving process? Well, I don't, I don't think we've necessarily seen the extremes of that. Mm -hmm. um, 
in our in our program but I think that there is a particular challenge when it comes to teens because developmentally what are they supposed to be doing? That's They're right. supposed to be making that separation from their parents and other adults and going right. towards their friends and their peers. Mm -hmm. And as anyone out there listening who has ever been a teenager or who has teenagers can right. attest <laughs> that even in the best possible circumstances, that can be a very difficult transition to make. So imagine that you layer on to that a significant loss of a sibling or a grandparent or a parent mm -hmm. or a friend and um, it becomes even more confusing right. for parents and for the teens. So you can, you can see that real pulling away mm -hmm. and it's hard for parents, it's also hard for it's also hard for the teens. So that's part of what we can help parents with is there's a lot of conversations about, well, is this the grief or is this the normal <laughs> development? <laughs> right, so exactly. Trying to figure out, well, yeah, how hard with are teens. these really separate things and talking through some of that and providing parents some guidance, uh, what they might expect to see from their teens and some things that they can do to help, to help their teens. Communication yeah. is really, really important. And sometimes teens and kids don't want to talk to their parents. And one of the things that we suggest is starting a journal and journaling in it to your child mm -hmm. what you're thinking, what you're feeling, and then giving it to them, giving them the, uh, the chance to privately think about those questions and write back to their parent. Mm -hmm. And some people have said that that's really helpful. Um, I know mm -hmm. that in one of our groups we had a, one night, it was really funny because the two teens in the group at the time, they both were really frustrated with their other living parent because they were being very protective of them and the kids mm -hmm. wanted to do something right. and they wanted to go somewhere and the parent was very protective and they were just like, oh, I'm so angry and, <laughs> you know, and, and it, so normal, you know, so normal for them to be angry that their parent was being overprotective. But yet, on the other hand, you know, they lost a, a, a spouse. They don't right. want to lose their child, too. So very normal on both both ends. But I think for them to be able to come there and express that to people who didn't say, well, you shouldn't feel that way, right, you know, right. what do you expect the your parent? Response, yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, so for them to really get reassurance that it's okay to be upset and it's okay for your parent to, to be protective. Mm -hmm. that's, that's their job, you know. So I think that, yeah, I think that normalizing grief mm -hmm. and normalizing reactions and non-judgmental listening skills is, is really huge for mm -hmm. teens especially. So, well, Tell me a little bit more about your volunteer program and I, I have a question like what how would it affect your agency if you didn't have enough volunteers or people weren't really interested in doing that? We wouldn't be able to yeah. offer our services. Exactly. So I'm yeah. hoping it that the really people critical. out there, the audience, are hearing Very, this. Yeah. Um, and I think you know sometimes people say, "Oh my gosh, I couldn't even imagine. How would I do that? I don't know if I could." But um, there really is excellent training that everybody goes through ahead of time. And then, as Janice said, there's weekly support mm -hmm. and there's lots of experienced volunteers who are already a part who are there to help guide and support the new volunteers as they come on and on the night or the afternoon of service there's always either a staff person or a mental health consultant who's there mm -hmm. so if anyone has any questions or there's an unusual situation yeah. or a need right. or um, there's somebody right there. That's, uh, that's the way help, it was in hospice when and I make trained. Sure that you know, as a volunteer, smoothly. I mean, there was there were issues in some that might come places up. that yeah. come up, and you could go back and talk yeah. to someone and let them know 
Yeah, we yeah. don't ever want our volunteers to feel like they're carrying the weight of right. the program. Right. That's our job, and that's our consultant's job, and that's why it's it's really an amazing um, support system for the for the facilitators. Um, and our our volunteers go through a thirty hour training, but that's that's after they've come to an orientation mm -hmm. and they've they've talked about you know heard about all the things that the program is about all the different opportunities to volunteer mm -hmm. um, there's probably more clerical volunteering mm -hmm. done in Portland just because mm -hmm. that's where our main office is right. and sometimes it's sporadic around big events like we had some volunteers helping um, for our, our just recent markathon our auction which is coming up in February is our really big big event and so we, we, we use a lot of we use a lot of volunteers for that and so it's it's kind of sporadic for some of the events but mm -hmm day-to-day -day stuff um, you know we have we have people that you know come and empty our recycling I mean you name it we have people that help us on a day-to-day -day basis the rooms or whatever so, yeah yeah um, in particular in York County we also have um, a special York County committee because our program and service is new there uh -huh. we're really trying to raise awareness uh, and, and in all venues yeah. about who we are and what we do and so that people who need our service can come but also of course so that people who think you know this is an important and necessary service can get involved and support it and I know some of the, knows a lot of the high schools um, have support teens there yeah. in different areas even a couple of them come here um, so you know you probably could reach out to them too if you haven't already you know as a volunteer if they're especially if they're considering social work or anything right. that they're going into that might be and um, and, re and regarding teens, uh, we're also right now looking at how can we best serve teens in our program. So we would love to meet with some teens sure. um, who could advise us on you know, what kinds of content are teens interested, what m social media platforms are they using, so that if we <laughs> that we're not looking them for them on Facebook <laughs> if they're on Instagram or somewhere else I've not heard of yet. Um, so we really welcome that input because we also hear from teens themselves that they don't know what to do right. when a friend of theirs right. is grieving. Um, so and that young adult group, I think, is another group that's really... Um, re really because like you said they're they're moving out they're either you know getting their first job they might be getting an apartment sharing it they might be moving to a different city uh, you know going away to school and and there's no one there that they're connected with right. except for maybe a couple of friends but if they have a loss so we're trying to figure out how can we support them more you know we would uh, we would love to have a, a group down in, in York County for young adults as well, mm -hmm. um, but we need more volunteers in order right. to, st to staff that. Right. Um, but we know that the young adult group in Portland has been well received, mm -hmm. and that's been around. I would imagine so. Yeah. Yeah. But there's a lot of colleges, you know, and right. people, you know, die accidentally at colleges or, you know, um, suicide is. is that's a, another good a, place to yeah. look for volunteers is in colleges. Yeah, they all have to do internships or yes, we have wonderful yeah. interns. Yes, we, we have yeah. wonderful interns. interns. We yeah. talked a little bit about a consult. What what does a consult do at your agency? Oh, a consultant is someone who would um, provide that. Um, that piece that the staff person would provide. So if okay. usually our staff person is there one week and the consultant is there the next week. Mm -hmm. So if volunteers have any concerns, we also have um, team coordinators, which mm -hmm. are volunteers who have been there a little bit longer, that take a little more responsibility for the night. Mm -hmm. So 
again, volunteers. That's wonderful, But though. the consultant would um, work with the team coordinators on that night that if there was a group that had a difficult time or if they were concerned about a participant's safety, the team coordinators would bring that information back to the consultant and we would make sure that that person was cared for, mm -hmm. that, that that person got the necessary support that they needed um, right then and there. So the consultants are very and important. And what do you do for yourselves so you don't burn out? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> um, well, we take pretty good care of ourselves at work. Uh -huh. There's a lot of opportunity to get support from mm -hmm. each other and um, you we know, really practice the we model really practice, at, at, yeah. at work too. You know, and, um, our staff meetings are a little different than most staff meetings, uh -huh. but it it really does support the yeah. the entire um, the entire staff. So, and I mean, when you go yeah. home, what, I mean, you must still be carrying some of that with you. Yeah. You do. I find it's just over the years, really something that I've ha I've had to learn to separate from. Um, but I find, you know, in this, a core part of what we believe at the center is that each person has what they need to get through right. this difficult time and to find their way through their grief. And so I really hold on. That helps me <laughs> a lot <laughs> um, because you trust that I can help this person and they're going to be okay. It's not, it's not my responsibility. Right, right. Um, I'm here to, to help them yeah. how I can. So you should bring a plate of chocolate to your meeting. Oh, <laughs> we do often. It's yes. usually one of those little <laughs> self-care pieces. Yeah, right. We also have, um, we haven't touched on it yet, is the multicultural program that's yes. been part of the center in Portland for oh, 17, 17 years, years now. Yes. And that has been uh, something that we've, we're very proud of. Mm -hmm. Um, the directors that have have taken that to new levels and we work with the Portland schools mm -hmm. on that initiative and yeah. just there are a lot of them even in South Portland too a lot of uh, multicultural yeah. yeah. people in there and I worked with um, they called it around the world because there were 40 mm -hmm. children and they were all like three to oh maybe uh, seven yeah and most of them didn't speak English you know and we go along fine yeah <laughs> but we had a lot of people come in and volunteer to kind of work with them on their language skills um, before classes and after I mean we did cooking and things like that and I really enjoyed that and I really thought that's a way it, it, to communicate to your new neighbors now right. and to accept the fact that it's not just Caucasian, it's from other countries. Yeah, right. And we need to be more cognizant yeah. of what's going and on. For, you know, Portland is getting more and more diverse and yes, now people are, are starting, as you said, to move into surrounding towns and, and communities. And the multicultural program is designed to work with children who are refugees or immigrants or children of refugees who have experienced some personal losses themselves. But in addition to that, we call collective loss of their culture and their community, their connections to others because of war and violent conflict or natural disaster. Uh, so the program started originally uh, there was a murder of a Cambodian boy and so the center responded w with crisis support which we do we we'll go into schools to provide some support mm -hmm. and consultation if they experience the death or serious illness of a child or a student or um, staff member but it became very obvious mm -hmm. in responding to this that it wasn't it wasn't just the grief was not just the death in this tragedy of this one boy. It was all that that community had already sustained on top of it. So that was the impetus for the multicultural program. Mm -hmm. So since then, the need hasn't changed. No. It's only changed, you know, where the countries that children and families are coming from. So that is a very 
exciting program to be a part of and that's also the same model all facilitated by trained volunteers mm -hmm. so we work with two schools now Riverton Elementary and Lincoln Middle School in Portland and um, this is breaking news we'll be able to expand the program to high school students starting oh, in January wonderful. so we're very excited about that um, it's Friday afternoon for anybody who's listening to, oh, I can't wait to volunteer. It'll be Friday. Um, come on down. So that that's happening. And then the other thing that we offer to the community, which we want to make sure people know about, is training and consultation. So it, we talked a little bit about the crisis response, that in the moment, if uh -huh. a school or business needs some support, we can offer that. We also offer training. So we'll go to hus the hospital, daycare, schools, medical providers, churches, uh -huh. um, university classrooms, anywhere really. Uh, where they'd like to learn more about grief, grief support and children's grief, intercultural awareness, collective loss, all these different areas of expertise that, and that we have. Can, itself can bring you yeah. a lot of volunteers. And of course, children who are grieving are not just grieving at home or right. at it's the one hour that they come to the center. Right. Yeah, it's everywhere. So it's really, and it's... Uh, also very common, I don't think people know that w one in 20 children and teens, or I'm sorry, one in seven children and teens before age 20 will experience the death of a parent or sibling. And I think that is staggering. Staggering. Yeah. And yeah. so then you say it to yourself, is. well, wait a minute. What about friends? Yeah. What about the kids who are being cared right. for by their grandparents? And, you know, all these other significant relationships that kids have are not even in that statistic. Mm -hmm. So it's really very, very prevalent, um, but, it, but not always noticed, right. not always recognized. And right. all of the information that we're telling you here, like about volunteering and our programs, are all on our website, right. so, um, which will be cgcmaine.org, right yeah. and mm -hmm. the orientations for any of the volunteer trainings and all those dates and all those specifics are on that yeah. website as well. Yeah, but so. um, the, the simple way to get involved in any capacity, if you need information, if you want services, if you'd uh -huh. like to volunteer or offer support, just pick up the phone right. and call us. That's yeah. really the first step. Everybody has a phone now, yeah. right? Exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Or stop in. If you don't have a phone, you can just right. well, I'd like later. to do that myself. Yeah. But I just thank you both, Susan and... Um, I'm going to forget your name. <laughs> yes. Um, just for being here and, and letting everyone know about your agency, because I'm sure there are many people that are going to be watching this later when it's aired, and they're going to utilize that program, especially here. They're not far from, from Sanford. Yeah. Um, and, of course, a lot of the people probably know more in in um, Portland than they do um, as far as um, the awareness of your agency and the volunteering part of it. Um, so I hope that everyone is uh, grateful to these people for doing this kind of work because it is difficult. And as a traveling social worker, I know how difficult it can be, and this is even worse. So, uh, more so, I should say. So, I hope that you will um, call them, pick up your phone, look on, at the sub website on your uh, computers or on your phones, and find out more if you want to uh, volunteer, if you have the need because of a sudden or a horrific kind of um, death of someone uh, that was close to you, a friend or a child, um, and let them know, and they can help you. Use that help. Don't sit back and don't don't stand back and just be sad and, and don't know where to turn because there's somewhere to turn if you go to these, this agency. So we thank you for being here, and we'll see you again on Paula's Picks.